Hey, I'm Jesse. Let's have a devotional together. We're in Acts chapter 17. We're going to begin in verse 14. Before we start, here's a quick word of context. And it's remarkable too how even this context, as ancient as this context note is, it's still relevant today, even, even going so far as to influence our modern day vocabulary. There was this ancient religion known as Gnosticism. And you'll sometimes hear it framed as though Gnosticism is older than Christianity. That something took place before the birth of Christ does not make it older than Christianity. Okay, don't be swayed by that Christian. We know what took place before the birth of Christ. Most of our Bible is also about what took place before Christ. For crying out loud, the Christian worldview begins with the generation of all physical matter ex nihilo. Okay, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. There's nothing that could possibly come before that. That's it. That's the beginning of time itself. So don't be intimidated by religious worldviews that came about before the birth of Christ. There are thousands of them, and we know about them. And most of our Bible, presenting over the Old Testament, actually took place before the birth of Christ, too. So that something came about before Christ's birth doesn't mean that it's more true than Christianity. This ancient religious worldview was known as Gnosticism, from the Greek word gnosko, meaning to know. And it was divided into two camps, the Stoics and the Epicureans. Gnosticism at its core is a dualist religion, to separate the spirit from the body. The Stoics believed that whatever the, whatever the body did infected or affected uh, the spirit. And so you had to chastise the body to protect the spirit. And so this is where we get the word stoic from. If somebody is stoic, then they are emotionless. They're not prone to revelry. The Epicureans, however, said, hey man, the body and the spirit are totally unrelated entities. So eat, drink, and be merry for tomorrow we die. The body has no effect on the spirit. So party it up, yo. And I even met a guy who once who had a, had a tattoo of eat, drink, and be merry for tomorrow we die. And he said, it's in the Bible, bro. And I was like, do you know what it is in the Bible? <laughs> it's the motto of the Epicureans. Epicureanism leads to hedonism, meaning just live for pleasure because all that matters is pleasure. Here's the problem with that. Life is pointless. It's an empty life. It's an utterly unsatisfying one. But it's the opposite side of the same coin from Stoicism that is Gnosticism. So Epicurean is an adjective for somebody with rosy cheeks who likes to party, always has a giant oversized mug of wine in his hand because he's an Epicurean. Eat, drink, and be merry for tomorrow we die. The spirit and the body have nothing to do with each other. The Stoic is your boring friend who never joins in the party because he's afraid that what he does with his body will infect his spirit. Imagine the Gnostic point of view on Jesus, whose composition was fully God, fully man, his very existence spoke as the antithesis was utter anathema to the core paradigms of Gnosticism. So these Gnostics would actually infiltrate the church. In fact, that's the impetus behind the original authorship of 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. John wrote to counter the Gnostic teachings. They would go so far as to make fraudulent, spurious gospels, like the, uh, the Gospel of Philip, the Gospel of Mary Magdalene, the Gospel of Judas. One particularly bold writer wrote the Gospel of Jesus. These were the texts drawn upon by Dan Brown in his authorship of the Da Vinci Code books. I read the Da Vinci Code. It was a great fiction book. I got it in the fiction department. He even got the language wrong. They weren't written in, they weren't written in Aramaic, they were written in Coptic, Dan. Now, these Stoics and Epicureans are just now encountering Christianity for the first time in this text. Then, the brothers and sisters immediately sent Paul away to go to the coast, but Silas and Timothy stayed on there. Those who escorted Paul brought him as far as Athens, and after uh, receiving instructions for Silas and Timothy to come to him as quickly as possible, they departed. While Paul was waiting for them in Athens, isn't that funny? He's supposed to be just waiting. This is a layover, Paul. Okay, you're supposed to go get a taco and watch soccer on TV, but he doesn't. He was deeply distressed when he saw that the city was full of idols. Here we go. So he reasoned in the synagogue with the Jews and with those who worshiped God, as well as in the marketplace every day with those who happened to be there. Some of the Epicurean and Stoic philosophers also debated with him. Some said, what is this ignorant show-off trying to say? Others replied, he seems to be a preacher of foreign deities because he was telling the good news about Jesus and the resurrection. 
They took him and brought him to the Areopagus and said, May we learn about this new teaching you are representing. Because what you say sounds strange to us, and we want to know what these things mean. Now all the Athenians and foreigners residing there spent their time on nothing else but telling or hearing something new. So they're going to dig this. This is new. Jesus is the one true God. He is fully God and fully man, turning Gnosticism on its head, and he resurrected from the dead, fulfilling the old covenant. And now everyone who believes in him will be saved. I love Paul's fearlessness. It was more than just a layover for him. It led to the introduction of the gospel to the Stoics and the Epicureans. You're going to hear more about these guys later. They're going to influence his later epistles. You're never just on a layover, Christian. You're never just sitting where you're sitting. When the Spirit prompts you to take your tacos to the next table to meet someone new, please don't be creepy, but do listen to the Spirit's prompting. In my experience, when the God tells you, get up and go do something, like Paul could not contain himself. Every day he was engaging in the synagogue, engaging with the philosophers. And every day he did this. In my experience, if you come up with an excuse as to why you shouldn't bring up the gospel to the person on the seat next to you on your flight, if you bypass it, God will use someone else. You'll miss the opportunity, and then it's not the same again. Oh God, call me again, I'm willing now. Sometimes it's not the same, and it's just too late. That's my experience, that's my conviction. I looked at the example of Paul, who was supposed to be in layover mode, but instead engaged the synagogue, engaged the Stoics, engaged the Epicureans, and this influenced world history. This, in fact, would lead to the effective end of the Stoics and the Epicureans. They just didn't know it yet. You're never just on a layover, Christian. Like Paul in Acts 17, God has you there for a reason. So maybe don't get so upset when your flight's delayed because there's somebody there for you to reach that you couldn't reach before. This is the book of Acts. It's still happening today in terminals all over the US. So let's go live out the book of Acts. Are you ready? Are you really ready, my introverts? Go.